here. Anybody ever seen these emojis before? Hands up, say aye. Aye. Who hasn't? Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna explain what these emojis mean because these are, these are kind of our classic emojis, my emojis, but what this means, and this is how you can apply it to your life, is could be really important. So that fist bump means to knock away the fears and the memories of the past, everything that's ever held you back before in your life. Put those behind you and in the past. The rocket ship is your brain. Point your brain at the future you want to create, get a clear vision and get pointed to it. And the heart is the signature of love because when you love everybody or you bring love to everything, it raises the vibration. So everybody stand up. You know, normally what I'd like you to do is go trade rows and give everybody a hug because hugs are nice, but with the COVID probably some people might not stop. Not, not do that. So what I want everybody to do right now is just pretend you're slapping fives and, and everything and just go around the room and say, I am a millionaire genius. I am a millionaire genius. I am a millionaire genius. And go around the room and get a little energy going. I'm a something's wrong because we don't have our mask. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And, and we don't judge you for wearing masks and don't judge us if we're not wearing masks. But we want to be safe, everybody. So make sure you wash your hands and wear a mask and keep some distance apart from each other. And look, this has been some trying times with the election coming and everything. But what does this mean to all of us? The opportunity is out there. It's getting ready. So we want to help you all get positioned for 2021, which is going to be the most dynamic time zone of us have maybe ever seen in real estate. With the prices going up and inflation still going on, um, and Jay Scott will tell you a little bit more about inflation and all that kind of stuff, but there's never been dynamics like this before with, a, with so much money in the streets and 3% interest rates at the same time, unemployment and people not working. There's gonna be opportunities out there for everybody. But, but before we get started tonight, I wanna Say not only thank you all for coming here tonight and taking time out of your lives to come share with us, I want to acknowledge some people that have kept this going over the past six months because i got to tell you what, man, change. You know, the world has changed. And there's only one constant thing that we all ever have, and that is change. So for those of us who learn how to pivot and capitalize and keep moving our feet in times of change, are ones that learn how to move forward and make a better life. So over these last six months, we went from totally live, doing IQ every week and doing monthly meetings here and having three-day events where we're training people and, and sharing our experience with them. Over the last six months, it all changed and we didn't have, any, have that anymore, so we had to make a little pivot. And there's some people in the room that have been part of that pivot, and without them, we couldn't have had it happen. And so I'd like to have... Um, Okay. Brittany, Catherine, Paul, Jill, wherever Jill is, Paul, Jill, Charlotte, Troy, Chad, and anybody who's been on, on any of our virtual, not as, 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 who's ever been, a, not a participant, but who's ever been there and, and helped us get, keep our message going out to the public, please stand up. You know. And if you're standing up in the back, stay standing. All the pretty girls in the back, except we got Brittany up here. Let's give them a round of applause. Because without them and without you, we wouldn't have this, what we have going on tonight. And this is evidence right now tonight that there's a need for people to get together. People with people doing business and sharing, sharing with each other. And one of our philosophies here at REI Live and IQ is it's your network that determines your net worth, and it's collaboration, not competition. And that's what we've been brought together to do, is to share our knowledge with you guys. We're just local investors. You know, we're not professional speakers, we're not entertainers, although hopefully maybe you'll think some of us are entertaining. 
Can I hear everybody say aye? Aye. Uh, you guys are hardly with me. But we're here tonight to bring you some information that's going to be useful for you. Besides getting together and meeting some people, which is great, we're going to give you some information that you can actually help you with your business. If you haven't done any real estate business, maybe help you get launched and started. How many people in this room have uh, done more than one deal in the last six months? Raise your hand. Take a look around the room, people. People who have not take a look at the people who have. Those are people that you're going to want to get with because a lot of people sat on the sidelines when this happened. Okay? A lot of people just stopped doing what they're doing and kept themselves locked up in their life and didn't get out there when the opportunities were ready to have, just like in 2008, 2009. And I don't know if any of you have been around for that experience, but let me see. Anybody in real estate back in 2008 and 2009? Okay, we got a few of us in the room, and those of us that are still here today persevered through that time, and some of us really capitalized. I was one. I was one of those people. So as you're looking to move forward and get yourself into the real estate business, it's good for you to, got, to align yourself with people that have been through it before and can give you and share their experience, strength, and hope, and what's actually happened for them. And, and all of us know that are sitting here tonight, 2021 turned out to be a banner year for most of us who kept going. Prices kept going up high, and after that first 45 days, um, things got back on track, and, and it was those who stayed in the game and did not get fearful. And we're here to help people that overcome their fears and get their first, second, third deals, and, and to actually bring us all together. We're a community of like-minded people who want to share with everybody exactly what we're doing. What's next? Okay. <laughs> And it's me. Hi guys. So I am Ricky Preventure. I typically host these, but Mark has so much energy. We love putting them up first, of course. So I am Ricky Preventure. I uh, have been wholesaling properties with my husband since 2013. A little bit of a backstory for me. It's kind of a funny story is that I was a broke college student living off of ramen noodles back in 2013. Met Paul. And he made more money off of his first deal than I did for my entire year's salary. And I said, okay, I'm a believer. <laughs> so that's my backstory. I've been doing this since 2013. But real quick, guys, uh, just some <coughs> reminders. We have a couple social media handles I want to get out to you guys. So REI Live SRQ and REI Live SRQ.com and Investor Quarters. So please find us on social media. And we are now on YouTube. So our wonderful Catherine in the back, wave your hand. Hey, y'all. Uh, she is uploading all of our videos, including tonight's video, uh, for our, uh, Mike back there, our camera guy. Hey, Mike. Woo! Um, and make sure that when you go to our page, please hit the bell at the top, subscribe to our channel. It'll give you a notification whenever we upload. This is free information, amazing knowledge to have, and it's all local that we're doing here in this area. And if my clicker would work, there we go. So what is REI Live? REI Live is a new, modern way for entrepreneurs to network together. Uh, typically, we meet in person. This is our first one back since, I think, February or March. I'm not sure that we got to February. March. Was it February? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have now launched in five cities, guys. Uh, we originated in Birmingham, Alabama, Columbia, and us here in Sarasota launched on the same day. And then we have opened Atlanta and Orlando since then. And we always have a keynote speaker. And tonight is Jay Scott, so we're super excited. Um, investor quarters. I uh, didn't really explain what that was. So at, uh, what is the address? 1945 17th Street? Yep. Yes. Are we still virtual or are we doing it? Still virtual. Still virtual, awesome. So go to facebook.com investor slash investor quarters. You can see all the schedules and you can sign up for stuff for virtual. And again, this is free information. Always sign up, great stuff. Uh, on Tuesday, we have all you need to know about short-term rentals, and then Tuesday, November 10th, Paul Del Pozo, who is one of the owners of PropStream, he's diving into their new app, so that's really awesome. And guys, we have on REA Live SRQ, we've got swag for you guys, so just like your cool mask that we handed out to you, we have t-shirts and mugs and all that good stuff, so go to the website, check it all out. We also have LeadX, um, this is a company that I started a couple years ago. It is really to help you kickstart your business. So if you need discounted lead lists, websites, CRMs, all that good stuff, um, different alternatives for the MLS like PropStream, prop skip tracing tools, and discounted mail. 
uh, please contact either Catherine or I, and we'll get you in contact with them. Apparently, I've got to be close enough, huh? And guys, we have two pages of sponsors. If you are a sponsor here, and I see one right up here, hey, Chad, please stand up for me real quick. We just want to say thank you so much if you're a sponsor. We've got two pages of sponsors, guys. Woo! Chad, stand up, man! Woo! <laughs> Thanks, um, and then this is our actual contact information for Paul, Mark, Catherine, and I. We are the behind-the-scenes people, in the front-of-the-scenes people. Uh, these are our actual cell phone numbers if you have any questions about what's going on, especially now that we've been virtual, now we're back live. Um, please text us. This is not a bad date. These are our real phone numbers, I promise you. And so some upcoming stuff. So next month we actually made it a little bit different. So we changed the date. It's the first time we've ever done that in two years. I know, guys. Um, and it's the day before Thanksgiving, so November 25th. We'll be here in person for our next REI Live, and then December 10th as well. And then going into December, we have a three-day event. It's going to be December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And that's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And that's going to be a three-day deep dive. And I will have Mr. Mark come back up here and go into a little bit more on that. Thanks, guys. All right, let's have a round of applause. I know, she wasn't expecting all of that, but she knows this stuff better than I do. Uh, what's coming up next is you're going to know better. So, okay. so anyways, like, like said, how, how many people in this room know somebody who's made money in good times in real estate and in bad times in real estate? That's right. Because remember, if you watched me ever on Facebook before or heard what I say, it's always the right time to buy real estate if you buy real estate the right, right way. way. Okay, the right way. And, and so it doesn't matter what's going on in the marketplace out there. If you can control the noise between your ears and how you're thinking about what's happening, there's always opportunities in real estate and they're coming right now. A lot of you guys. At the beginning, I mean, every year that I've been up here, people have had reasons not to get involved in real estate. You know, last year it was the economy, or the year before it was the economy. And for those of you who just kept waiting for the exact right time to buy real estate, you're sitting in this room thinking to yourself, well, I didn't buy any real estate. But it's always the right time. When interest rate's so low, it's how you structure deals will make the difference of whether it's a good buy or bad buy. So. Um, how many people believe that having a coach and a community of like-minded people can help them succeed in their real estate career? Say aye. 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 All right, all right. And uh, how many people believe that working with a, how many people would like to partner with somebody who's done hundreds of deals before in this marketplace and actually be a partner with them? Aye. Say a show of hands. That's right. So getting involved with IQ and REI Live gives all of you the opportunities to get up close and personal with us and actually partner with deals that we're doing together. And that's exactly what you do when you join. And we're getting ready to get positioned for 2021, which is going to be a great year in real estate. Click. Ah, there it is. Coming up December 3rd through 5th, as uh, Brittany mentioned, we have a three-day event. How many days? Three. three. All right, just to check and see who's listening. Three-day event, December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. You will not want to miss this because this is going to give you the opportunity to actually get positioned for great success in 2021. And here's a little bit about what we're doing. Catherine's going to tell you about it. Yeah, so each day we dive into a different strategy. So the first day is all going to be about marketing for deals and how to find those discounted deals because we all know that if it's on the MLS, it's not going to last more than, what, 30 minutes? And that's even how quick retail listings are going if they're priced right. So how to find those usually discounted deals and then how to structure your wholesale transactions analyzing property and we'll actually be talking about CRM systems. The money is really in the follow-up. It's proven time and time again. If you haven't heard it, um, please go talk to Todd and Marilyn Donovan. They're working on that right now. So uh, the, the money is in the follow-up. So that's going to be day one. Day two, we're going to dive into rehabbing. So how to budget your money for a rehab, how to budget your time for a rehab, what are realistic numbers and time frames for doing that. We'll be having some of our partners and friends from Specialized Trust talking about how you can use uh, self-directed IRAs to finance deals and how to raise money to where you're not paying those hard money loans or using all your cash at once. Um, and then day three is going to be talking about uh, rental 
property. Some of you guys may know Brandon Henderson. He'll be back in to talk about multifamily and the amazing success that he's had over the last couple of years building over 50 doors, um, which is insane. Uh, so he'll be in talking. We'll have our partners, including Chad and Jill in the back, talking about um, analyzing um, how to structure your ownership of the properties and how to property management those because, of course, we're all in this to have financial freedom, right, and not work every day. Maybe? No? I got a couple of months? Yes? No? Maybe? So we Who's want looking for financial freedom? Say aye! Aye! All right, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. So we'll be diving into that on day three. Um, oh. Before we have Jay, Jay come up, I want Paul to go up. How many people know Paul? Okay, if you don't know Paul, Paul and Brittany started REI Live, and Paul's my partner here, and we, we both have, you know, quite a bit of experience. Paul might want to get, might not want to tell you, but 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 I'm going to ask him just a little bit about what's going on in your life and, and, and your background and some experience, so the people who don't know you can get a chance to know you and what they're going to be part of what they're going to be getting when you come. I've been doing it since 2003. I've done. 30 plus so sales a year pretty much since 2011. And now I'm doing more buying holds and buying fixed clubs. All right, let's hear it for Paul. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I've been in real estate pretty much since 1978. In the last 20 years here in Sarasota, Manatee County alone, I've flipped over a thousand properties. I've got several hundred rental properties. I also wholesale houses, and I've written a couple books. One went Amazon bestseller. And for everybody who's here tonight, my new book just came out. It's called Your Time Is Now, and your time is now getting ready for 2021. Whoever comes back next month to our November 25th is going to get a free copy of Your Time Is Now, and we're also going to have a raffle to get a, a, a session of coaching with uh, Paul or I or both of us together. So if you're here tonight, make sure you put that date on next month. Come back and get a free book and come back out and join us. And get plugged into what we're doing here. And we got a great event coming December 3rd through 5th, which if you want to get uh, tickets to that or, or sign up for that, we can do that at the back afterwards. We may remind you again of that as we close this out. I think with no further ado, uh, we're going to introduce our special guest tonight. Some of you may have heard of him. How many people in the room have heard of Jay Scott? Let's hear it, let's hear it, let's hear it. He's uh, he's one of the, I don't even know everything he does, there's too much for me to say, but he's from bigger pockets and has a great following and he's been in all kinds of areas of real estate and he knows a lot of information that, that I don't know. And he's got economics and statistics and all kinds of ways to look at real estate. So he's going to come on up here and, and share with you some of his knowledge, but also be open to questions um, that you may have that I may not be able to answer or that he can answer in a different way. So with no further ado, we will have Jay Scott. Jay Scott, welcome. start with that. Um, but uh, I obviously haven't done any of this for a while, so thank you for coming out. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to, I, I could give a presentation. I'm not going to give a presentation because what I found when I give presentations, typically 20% of the people will walk out saying, wow, that is the, exactly what I needed to hear. That's all the information I needed. The other 80% of people will say, yeah, that was fine, but it wasn't what I was looking for. So what I would rather do is, I'm happy to talk about a lot of things, and I'll talk a little bit about my background, what I do, what I've done. Uh, but I would prefer to open it up as a discussion. 
So if nobody has questions, I'm happy I can talk for the next 12 hours on whatever I want to talk about and you may or may not be interested. But what I'd rather do is I'd rather open it up and, and see what you guys are interested in hearing about and talking about right now. And then we're ha I'm happy to talk about that. So I'm going to give you some time to think about if you have any questions. And I'll go into a little bit of backstory about who I am and what I've done. Um, I tell you this for the main reason uh, that I started where all of you started. Um, and I started where a lot of you are today. I bought my first house back in 2008. Actually, it was my personal residence. I bought my personal residence at 37 years old. Um, I am 49 now, so I started when I was relatively old compared to a lot of people. Um, and I started uh, basically with no knowledge, no experience whatsoever. I literally never purchased a house before. I have an electrical engineering degree. My wife says I still can't change a light bulb, and by that she means she won't let me. Um, so literally, I started with nothing. I started with no experience. From a money standpoint, I'm not gonna lie, I started with a little bit of money, but when I bought my first two houses in 2008, I paid cash. And those were supposed to be flips. They ended up not being flips, and I had my, all my cash tied up for many years in those first two deals. So for all intents and purposes, I started with no money also, because if I wanted to do more deals, I had to figure out where to get the money from. And so I've gotten money from all over the place. I haven't used my own money for a deal since 2010. Um, I haven't had to use my own money for a deal since 2010. So for anybody out there that's thinking, I don't have the money to do this, it doesn't matter. And for anybody that's thinking, I don't have the experience to do this, it doesn't matter. For anybody that's thinking, oh, I'm, I'm older, doesn't matter. For anybody that's thinking, whatever your excuses, it doesn't matter. If I can do this, everybody can do it. So 2008, uh, my wife and I were working together. We decided to get married. Uh, we decided to quit our jobs, move to the East Coast. We settled down in Atlanta. And we didn't know what we were going to do. We thought about starting a business or starting something. We had no idea what that was going to be. Summer of 2008, we were in Atlanta. We were in the hardest hit market in the country during the worst recession in 100 years. And my wife was watching HGTV, which if anybody was watching HGTV back in 2008 knows there's only one thing on HGTV, and that was flip shows. Same thing today. Um, and so my wife said, let's flip a house. While we're trying to figure out what business we want to start or what we want to do with our lives, let's flip a house. Again, I thought she was kidding because I had no experience. I couldn't swing a hammer, but she's a design marketing type person, so she was excited about flipping a house. So 2008, we flipped our first several houses. Um, paid cash for the first two, those did not go well. I'm happy to talk about those if anybody wants to hear all of our mistakes. But basically, we flipped a bunch of houses. Here we are 12 years later. Um, we flipped about 450 houses. Um, we own, we bought dozens of rentals. Um, we have um, bought small and mid-sized multifamily. Uh, we just bought a $20 million, 150 unit apartment complex a couple months ago. Uh, this week, we're hoping to put a $43 million, 318 unit complex under contract. Um, we've done lending, we've done notes, we've done origination. And again, my experience was, I guarantee you, no more than any of you, probably less than a lot of you when I started back in 2008. So the point is, I've done over 70 some million dollars worth of real estate in the past 12 years. I own a couple hundred units. And hopefully it'll be 318 more after this week. Um, and I started with the same place everyone else starts and the same place everyone else is now. So in 12 years, you can do that. In fact, if you're smart, and I'm not that smart, you can do it a lot faster. So I'm happy to talk about flipping houses. I've done a lot of that. I'm happy to talk about estimating rehab costs. I wrote a book on that. I'm happy to talk about rentals or Burr. Everybody's talking about Burr these days. I'm happy to talk about multifamily syndication. I'm happy to talk about the economy. I've written a lot about the economy recently. Um, whatever anybody wants to talk about, I'm happy to talk about. And if nobody has anything to talk about, I'll just make some stuff up. Yeah. yeah where, where are the, right now, what makes you excited geographically and what, what asset class? Okay. Uh, the question was, what makes me excited geographically and what asset class? Uh, it's a tough question. I guess that kind of gets into the economy. Um, and I guess I didn't really need much of a segue to talk about the economy these days. So let's talk about the economy. We're in a weird place right now, no doubt about it. So um, if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have said, and people did, and I did say, I thought we were due for a recession for a whole lot of reasons back in 
2019, I saw the writing on the wall, I thought we were going to see a downturn. Now, when I say recession, that doesn't necessarily mean 2008 type of event where the real estate market crashes and, and, and everything comes crumbling down and unemployment goes to 10%. Uh, I just thought that we were going to see a natural cycle with, with a downturn. Um, obviously, I didn't predict COVID, nobody predicted COVID, but March came, COVID hit. Um, and here we are eight months later, and we are, well, good economic news, pretty good economic news came out this morning with GDP, so third quarter, we saw a nice little rebound in, in, in the economic output of the country, um, so that's good. But we're still in a place right now where we're at 8% unemployment, we're printing trillions of dollars, there are millions of businesses that are going under. There are millions of people, renters, that aren't paying rent, but can't get kicked out because of eviction moratoriums. There are millions of homeowners, 8% of homeowners right now are not paying their mortgages, and their lenders are allowing that through forbearances. Um, at some point, all this is gonna come to a head. At some point, the stimulus is gonna run out. At some point, the government's gonna stop sending checks. At some point, the government's gonna stop increasing unemployment payments. At some point, the government's going to stop supporting small businesses with PPP and EIDL loans. At some point, the eviction moratoriums are going to end and people are going to have to start paying their rents. At some point, the forbearances are going to end and people are going to have to pay back their loans. At some point, a day of reckoning is going to come. My guess is we're probably three, four, five, six months away from that. I think after the election, regardless of who wins, um, and I we start with, I hate all politicians, so I'm not going to talk politics because I'll just get angry no matter what we talk about. Um, but I have a feeling the next three, four, five, six months, we're going to see the stimulus come to an end. We're going to see the, the, the uh, eviction moratorium come to an end. We're going to see small business money come to an end. We're going to see big business bailouts coming to an end. Um, we're going to see forbearance coming to an end. And I think there's going to be a softening. And I think that that general economic softening may or may not, I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to see another general economic softening. I think we're going to see a double dip in the economy. Whether that'll hit real estate or not, I don't know. But here's the thing. I started in 2008. I started in Atlanta, which was literally the hardest hit market in the worst economy in a century. And I did 14 flips in 2008. I did 30 flips in 2009. And then I went up from there. And so it doesn't matter what the economy is as long as you know how to navigate it, as long as you know how to do the right things, and as long as you're focusing on the right types of deals and making smart decisions. So in terms of what markets I think are good and what asset classes I think are good, certainly there are some markets that are, that are riskier than others. I wouldn't want to be in New York City right now. I wouldn't want to be in Chicago. I wouldn't want to be in San Francisco. We all know people are moving out of these areas. People are typically are moving out of high density areas with high taxes and, and high unemployment, and they're moving into lower density areas with lower taxes and higher employment. Florida's a great place to be, which is crazy that I'm saying this because anybody that knew me a year ago, even though I was investing in Florida, I was saying Florida's gonna get hit hard. Because historically, if you look at economic trends, Florida gets hit hard, especially in the tourist areas of Florida. But here we are a year later, and the trends that I'm seeing tell me that Florida is actually probably going to be more resilient than most areas of the country. We have low taxes, we have decent employment numbers, um, and, and we have a very resilient economy. Certainly there are parts of the economy that are at risk. I wouldn't want to necessarily be flipping houses in Orlando. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to be flipping houses in certain other high tourist areas. And you could argue Sarasota is, but for the most part it's not. Um, there is other industry here. There's healthcare, there's education, and there's plenty of retail. So for the most part, I think Florida is a really good place to be right now. And again, a year ago, I would not have said that. But I'm saying it now, yeah. Fulton and DeKalb County, would you be in it right now? Say it again. Fulton and DeKalb County, Georgia, would you be in it right now? I don't like Georgia right now. Why not? Um, because I've seen what prices have done in Georgia. I've seen where affordability is in Georgia. Um, I have invested in Cobb. I haven't invested in Fulton. That's not true. I, I, we did some building in, in Fulton back in like 2013. Um, Atlanta, Atlanta is typically at risk of, of big downturns because they have big swings in their prices. And affordability in Atlanta is really low. Prices are really high relative to wages in Atlanta. 
And typically affordability, the affordability metric is the first thing I look for in terms of how hard is something can get hit during the downturn. Because during the downturn, what happens? People lose their jobs, they get their wages cut, they get their hours cut. And that all impacts affordability. So any areas that have low affordability numbers going into a downturn typically get hit pretty hard. Atlanta, especially the Atlanta proper, um, has real low affordability right now. And so I'm not a big fan. That said, we still do a whole lot of stuff in Georgia. We invest in Cobb County. We invest in Southern Georgia. Uh, my partner lives in DeKalb, and, and we invest some in DeKalb. Uh, but we're being really careful about Georgia. Follow up. What about Alpha Renta? I, I don't want to go into specific. Again, I, I, there are a lot of people here, so I don't want to go into real specific uh, on areas, especially outside of Florida. Uh, but in general, look at the numbers from 2008. If you're investing outside of Florida, the first thing I recommend is take a look at what happened in 2008. I'm a big believer that history is the best indicator of what's likely to happen in the future. So if you look at the 2008 numbers, and I'm not saying the 2008 is going to happen again, but look at the relative numbers. If a place you're looking to invest got hit disproportionately hard in 2008 compared to some other place, well, if we have another downturn that looks like 2008, or even if we have another downturn, that area is likely to get hit disproportionately hard. So if you saw an area, let's say I invested in, in, in D.C. a lot, D.C. saw prices drop about 12% in 2008, 9, 10. Uh, during that same time period where I was in Atlanta, saw prices drop 30 to 35%. So during the next downturn, I know that D.C. is going to be more resilient, or not know, but is, D.C. is likely to be more resilient than Atlanta. Because typically the same indicators that, that drive the, the housing market in D.C. are going to drive the housing market in D.C. 10 years later and 10 years after that. Employment's about the same, population growth is about the same, wage growth is about the same, employment diversity is about the same. So if D.C. was relatively resilient in 2008, during the next downturn, D.C. is probably set up to be pretty resilient. Now, again, these are things I've I been saying for a long time. These things have changed a little bit with COVID. Again, I would have a year ago said San Francisco is a great market to invest in because even when it has downturns, it recovers quickly and it recovers very well. I wouldn't invest in, in San Francisco right now. I wouldn't invest in Chicago. I wouldn't invest in New York. I wouldn't invest, invest in Boston. Um, so I'm staying away from the big cities. So definitely take a look at what happened in whatever markets you're looking to invest in 10 years ago and see proportionately how hard it got hit to other markets. And that'll give you an idea of how susceptible, how susceptible it is to getting hit the next time around. Question. So you said that you didn't like the affordability of Atlanta. How does Tampa Bay and Tampa Bay area in general compare to that? Better or worse? So I haven't seen the Tampa numbers. So in Sarasota, affordability is actually, if, if you look compared to the rest of the country, it's kind of right there in the middle, right? Medium. Um, so I like Sarasota. I like south of Sarasota. So go down to, um, down to Fort Myers. Um, we do some investing in Tampa. We have, I have some friends that probably know Tampa better than I do. We, we've invested, I do invest in Tampa. Uh, but I don't know Tampa at all. Um, but the, the reason I ask and the reason I mention is because in my experience, I'm not a Floridian, right? You know, I moved from Texas a few years ago. And um, moving out of Texas to invest in real estate is a pretty unpopular opinion. I think that Texas is, is overpriced the same way you think it's overpriced. And I think that while well, home affordability from an entry level price perspective might be more affordable here in Florida, I also argue that the wages are significant yep. as a whole. So I'm just wondering, in relation to each other, is a, is it even more, is it really more affordable here in, in the Tampa? And I say the Tampa area, Sarasota, St. Petersburg. But things uh, things can ten, yeah. things tend to change a lot between Sarasota and other areas, and Fort Myers and Naples and other areas. When you look at affordability indexes, you have to look at things like net worth, you have to look at income, you have to look at wage growth, employment diversity, housing prices, and a whole bunch of things. Um, but when you look at that data, they have some real complicated formulas that, that kind of merge it all together in, in a way that basically says, how easy is it for somebody who on a typical salary, a typical job, a typical location to afford a house at the median house price? Um, and that can change significantly from a place like Sarasota to Tampa because it's entirely different economy. People in Tampa, uh, there's completely different employment 
um, uh, diversity of employment in, in Tampa than there is in Sarasota. Completely different demographic, socioeconomic, age, everything between those two places. And so if you look at, at um, if you would think they're close enough that affordability indexes should be pretty close, but they're not. I, and I shouldn't say they're not. I don't know. I don't know what Tampa is, but they're not necessary. So I think, um, I know I'm more interested in Sarasota just because this is where I invest. When I look at houses that are like, okay, it's not, you know, typical regular investment property, it's about the same price that it was in 2008 right before a bubble. Yep. So and obviously the mortgage kind of created that, but do you see any type of a bubble yourself? I, I didn't know any indicators of what was happening with the mortgage, so I, I don't want to be caught off track necessarily. So there is, and it's funny because I, I had this discussion a lot last year when I was talking about the fact that I saw a downturn coming or I, I, I was thinking a downturn was coming. First question was, how's it going to impact real estate? Well, let's look at this from a historical perspective because again, history is the best indicator of what's likely to happen in the future. Uh, over the last 160 years, there have been 33 full economic cycles. So down, up, down, back up. Um, so we see recessions, if you divide 160 years by 33, we see recessions about every six years. So recession is not uncommon. And obviously 2008 was an anomaly. We don't normally see 2008 type recessions. But we see recessions pretty often. Every recession is different. Every recession is driven by something different. So obviously this one was driven by COVID. 2008 was driven by fundamental foundational issues in the mortgage and real estate industries. 2001 was driven by 9-11 and the tech bubble. Early 90s was driven by the savings and loan crisis from the late 80s. Go back to the 70s, that was driven by oil. Go back to the Great Depression, and that was driven by tariffs and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, every recession is driven by something. Uh, if a recession isn't driven by real estate, if there aren't foundational issues in real estate, more times than not, real estate isn't adversely affected to, to a disproportionate amount. 2008, real estate got crushed. 2001, barely got hit, it was a blip. Early 90s, real estate got hit pretty hard. But then you have to go all the way back to the 50s before you had a recession where real estate was hit. Between the 50s and the 90s, every recession, every general economic recession, didn't have a major impact on real estate. So, will this have an impact on real estate? We don't know. One of the big common factors, nobody knows why certain, certain recessions, if they're not driven by real estate, affect real estate versus not, but the consensus is, for the most part, that affordability plays a big issue. And so, if affordability is, is low, if, they, if people have, are having trouble affording houses, during a downturn, typically we see more of an impact on real estate. Across the country, affordability certainly not as bad as it was in 2008, because we've had significant wage growth, we've had significant um, employment growth, we've had significant economic growth. So even though prices are pretty close to 2008 prices, the economy has grown. We've had inflation, people are making more money. Um, but right now, across much of the country, affordability is pretty low. So if I had to guess, and it's just a guess, I, I know no more, trust me, even the economists have no idea, everybody's guessing. If I had to guess, I think a lot of areas of, country, of the country will see a real estate softening with the upcoming downturn, assuming the upcoming downturn materializes, which I think it will. Uh, there's a reasonable chance that a lot of areas of the country are going to see a real estate softening. Again, where are you investing? Real estate is local. So yeah, there are parts of the country I'm not going to invest in right now. There are other parts of the country I'm comfortable investing in. And again, I'm comfortable investing here. I'm comfortable investing in Florida in general. I'm not going to say every market is equal, like we were talking about. Affordability indexes change. Employment diversity changes. Uh, unemployment changes. Socioeconomic and age demographics change. But in general, I think Florida is actually a reasonable place to invest. Uh, we keep talking about uh, affordability index. Now, the question to that is, what is the best source of data for that? That's that's you know already synthesized. Or we're not trying to look at ten different data sets, and everybody has their own different way of calculating it. 
Is there a tool that you like that you use? That you use I, I'm trying to think who publishes affordability, and, and it's funny because when I got on this discussion, it's been going through my head for the last ten minutes. Where where's the affordability? Where am I finding the affordability data? Because I, I have a, I have a, a bookmark page, and I'm trying to think who it is that that's providing that data. And I don't think it's Case Schiller. Um, I don't know. That, it's crazy I should know that because I look at that data pretty often, but I don't know who is providing the data. A lot of great economic data, um, so in general, uh, general economic data, um, there is a, if you do a Google search for FRED economic data, so FRED is the Federal Reserve, um, basically they have charts for any piece of economic data, historic data that you could ever want. So I highly recommend start with FRED and then just type in whatever query I want to know about. Uh, wage growth historic. I want to know about GDP. I want to know about car prices. And basically, any data that the government or the Federal Reserve is tracking, they can show you historic charts. Um, I don't think affordability index is tracked by the Fed, so I don't think it's on Fred. Um, but I will find that information and I will post it in the Facebook group. And I apologize. I should know that. I, I don't. Thank you. Uh, you were so the question is, if I were starting over right now, let me tell you something. I am starting over right now. I don't. I, I just did a 150 unit multifamily. I'm getting ready to do a 318 unit multifamily. A year ago, I knew nothing about multifamily. Absolutely. And, and for anybody that says. Um, and th these are syndications. For anybody that says, oh, if you've done enough single family or if you've done enough small multifamily, the, the big stuff's easy. It's not. It's taken me a year and a half to learn this. So I am in this spot right now where I've essentially started over. I've done something new. So what do I do? First thing I do is I seek out people that have done it. The very first thing you need to do is you need to seek out somebody who has done it. You need to find people who have been successful and you need to do whatever you can to get them to help you. If it's paying a mentor, great. If it's going and finding somebody and saying, I've had people come to me and say, hey, I'll work for you for free. And these days, unfortunately, I don't do my own flips. Luckily, I have an amazing partner over there, Cliff Terry, who manages uh, a lot of our, our stuff. Um, we're a 50-50 partnership where he does all the work. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I've had people come to me and say, hey, can I work for you for free to learn? I have another partner that 10 years ago came to me and said, I want to learn from you. Can I just finance your deals? I was like, yeah, absolutely. 10 years later, we're still partnered together. He's still financing my deals. Um, and he's doing more flips than I am. He owns more rentals than I am. And he, he's, he's ahead of where I am. Um, because he realized 10 years ago that he needed to align himself with somebody that was doing what he wanted to do. So that's number one. Find the people that are doing what want to do. There's a whole group here of people yeah. that either have done what, you want to do, have done what you want to do or are going to do what you want to do or are trying to learn what you want to do. There's Mark who will teach you what you want to do. So start with this right here. When this thing ends tonight, don't leave. Talk. Meet people. Network. Exchange. Figure out the five people in this room that you want to meet again and Go to breakfast together, go to lunch together, start a Zoom group or whatever it is, start a Facebook group, network. So that's number one. Number two, read everything you can get your hands on. There's a lot of information out there. Who's familiar with bigger pockets? Okay, everybody's familiar with bigger pockets. So I don't I don't need to push bigger pockets. Um, but go read. There's so much free information out there. Go listen to, to Brandon and David's podcast. Go go read the forums, go read the blogs. Go read books. That's not going to get you to where you want to go. Because doing that first deal will teach you more than, than <laughs> reading a million books. But it'll give you some confidence. It'll teach you what questions you need to ask. It'll give you the, the background and the perspective. Um, and then keep, come, keep doing things like this. Keep networking. It's really that simple. But here's the biggest thing. You have to take action. And I know I, I sound like, I, I hate when I say it, and it comes out like, like that, that guru type, but you have to take action. Here's the, everybody always says to me, what secrets have you learned in real estate? I've learned one secret in real estate. There are no secrets in real estate, but anyway, I've learned one thing in real estate that, that has fundamentally, foundationally changed the way I view getting started in real estate. 
Over 12 years, I've probably talked to thousands and thousands and thousands of people that either are doing real estate or want to do real estate. And all of them fall into basically one of, one of two categories. They have not yet done a deal. So that's probably 95, 96, 97, 98% of them have not done a deal. Or they've done more than one deal. They've done two or five or 10 or 50 deals. You know who I don't meet? I don't meet anybody that does one deal. Because anybody that gets that first deal, you're gonna do a second and a third and a fifth and a tenth. Most people aren't gonna do the first. But if you do the first, the second one is 10 times as easy. And the third one is 10 times as easy as the second. And the fourth one's 10 times as easy as the third. It's getting over that speed bump. So my biggest piece of advice is do that first deal. Make yourself a promise that I'm gonna do one deal. And then say, if I hate it, if it doesn't go well, I'll give up and I'll never do another one. But promise yourself you're gonna do that first deal. Because I, I'll tell you, you do that first deal and you'll have done 50 deals or 100 deals in the next 10 years, okay? You talked about you were saying how when your first two that you put in cash and then you had to start over basically. How did you find the capital in those very early days? Yep. Oh, yeah. So first two deals I paid cash, got all my cash tied up in two deals that flips that went wrong, sort of they probably didn't go wrong. I just got so scared after not being able to sell them for two weeks. And let me tell you something, this, this, this was 2008 where I look back now and inventory in my town was about 10 months. So I shouldn't have expected to sell them in two weeks, but I got so spooked, I was like, oh, I need to rent these and just, just hold on to them because we're never gonna be able to sell them. Um, third deal, uh, I used hard money and a partner. Fourth deal, I used a portfolio lender. Everybody know what a portfolio lender is? So a portfolio lender is a small local bank. So if anybody here has tried to go to a Wells Fargo or a Chase or a big bank to get a loan for a flip deal, you've probably been disappointed. So. Big banks don't like to do flip deals. And I learned this, I actually, uh, it was my fourth deal that I, I went and I, I tried to do, uh, or my fifth deal, and I used a, a Wells Fargo to do a deal. The day before closing, the appraiser went out and he, he came back and he said, you know, the water heater's not working. Um, and I said, yeah, it's a flip. There are a lot of things that aren't working. He goes, well, we can't fund this deal if the water heater's not working. Um, Basically, it has to be moving ready. It has to have a stove, it has to have a fridge, the windows need to work, the water heater needs to work. So if you want to get a flip loan from a bank like Wells Fargo or Chase, any bank that basically sells that loan off to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or some other big lender, you're gonna be disappointed. So where do you get loans to do flips? Well, if you want to go to a bank, you go to what's called a portfolio lender. And a portfolio lender is a small local bank that lends to people like us, they lend to real estate investors and they are somewhere between a big bank and a hard money lender. They care about the deal, they want to see that it's a good deal, they want to see that you have good equity, they want to see that you have some experience, or you have people on your team that have some experience, they want to see that you have some income, they want to see that you have some net worth. Basically, you, it, it's not like a hard money lender where all they care about is the deal, and it's not like a big bank where all they care about is your financials. Somewhere in the middle. And these small local banks are awesome. I have gotten literally hundreds of loans from these banks. And the nice thing is, around here in this area, there are so many of them. So I'm happy to give you a list. If anybody cares about the banks, I can give you a list of, okay, you want the list? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So just in the last week, here are the three that I've done refis with. Um, there is Inglewood Bank and Trust. There is Cadence Bank. There is Ameris Bank, and E-R-I-S. Those are the three that we've done just in the last week. Um, there is Table Paul that we've talked to and we'll probably do a deal at some point. There's Synovus. Um, I know there's one or two more. Cliff, am I forgetting? Can you think of anybody? There's one, but I can't think of it either. Yeah. There's one more. I don't know some trust, maybe. The, the, but there's five. So, Inglewood Bank and Trust, Cadence, Ameris, um, Sable Palm, and Sonovus. Thank you. Yeah, so there, there are five right there, and I guarantee you there are more that I haven't found. So, there are banks around here that will give you money. So, where did I get the money? 
Um, well, my first deal, or the third deal, the first one that I borrowed was I had a partner who brought in the cash. And at that point, I thought like I knew how to flip house. I had already done two unsuccessfully, so <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew everything. Um, so I brought in a partner. I said, you put up the money, and I'll do what I've done two times already unsuccessfully. Um, but he did. But he did. And so that then I did hard money. Um, I did the... Um, the uh, um, uh, uh, big Bank, I did the Wells Fargo. So we actually went in before we closed on it and replaced the water heater because that's the only way they were gonna make the loan. Probably one of the dumber things we did. Um, but back then, there's a 50-50 shot, the loans weren't gonna close. Next deal, I used private money. So private money is people you know that have money that want to lend money because they want a better return than what they're getting either in their bank account or their IRA or their 401k or whatever it is that they have that money in. And they look at you and say, hey, I trust this guy enough that I'm going to lend money to them and, and, and they're going to pay me back with interest or partnership. Um, and after that deal, that was the sixth or seventh deal that we did with private money, um, I've basically been using that private money for the last 12 years. Um, so most of the money that I get are people that I know that have money sitting around, that know that I invest in real estate, and who know that they can get a better return from me than they can get from the stock market or from their from from sitting in a savings account or a CD. So, next question is how do you meet those people and, and how do you get them to give you money? The answer for me is you meet those people every day, everywhere. They're the people you know. The way you get them to give you money is you tell them what you're doing. You let them know that you're looking to flip a house or you're looking to buy a rental or you've flipped a house or you bought a rental. And you let them know that, hey, trust me, you tell people you, you do that or you want to do that, that sparks a conversation. Oh, really? Where do you want the house and how do you buy it and where are you getting the money? And eventually, you get to the point where you say, well, we borrow money from, from people just like you. And so, by the way, if you're ever looking to partner or if you ever like have money that, that you want to put in, we pay 10%, 12% interest. And you leave it at that. And you do that enough times and you start getting phone calls. People say, hey, uh, yeah, I just, I just got this money back and, and uh, I don't have anything to do with it. Do you still, still borrow money? And everybody's scared to ask for money because you feel like oh, nobody, nobody's going to do that for me. But let me tell you something. The people that give you money, they feel like you're doing them a favor. You're giving them 10% interest or 11% interest or 12% interest. They can't get that anywhere else. So there are a lot of people out there that, that are going to be happy to give you money with that type of return. You just need to prove to them that you're a good person and you're going to treat their money carefully and you're going to be a good custodian of their cash. And, and that's why it's best to work with people that, uh, that you know and people that trust us already. Um, and then after you've done two or three or five or ten deals, then you branch out and more people will start to find you. And uh, Mark, I bet can vouch for the fact that, that he's done enough deals now that he probably gets more people that want to give him money than, than he has deals to do. Well, I want to give you guys money too, so. <laughs> There's your first one. Oh, well, there you go. So, and he, he told you a formula that's really important, what he just said. The formula is ask. Absolutely. Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, and knock and the door will be open. If you don't ask for what you want out there in life, you're not going to get it. So a key thing to do is ask people for money. Ask people, do they know anyone who wants to sell a house? So learn how to use your mouth and not be scared. And the way you get not being scared is just like what he said. Read, get intelligent, ask the right questions, learn the lingo so you're comfortable interacting with people. Who here wants to flip houses? Okay, who here wants to own rentals? Okay, hopefully there's some overlap there because the two are definitely not mutually exclusive. Who here wants to do something different besides those two things? What? What do I want to do? Yep. <laughs> Uh, depends. What do you have? You <laughs> <laughs> have to ask questions that try to stop you. So fair, 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 fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> say, out, say out loud what you guys want to do besides rentals or flips. Uh, self storage multifamily. Self storage multifamily. Land. Land. Wholesale, anybody? Wholesale. 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 Okay. What have you guys done so far? How many offers have you made on self storage or multifamily? <laughs> About five. Excellent. How many offers have you made a lens? I'm in the reading phase. Okay. Fair enough. How many people in this room are looking to do their first, second, or third deal in the next 90 days? Put your hand up in the air. Okay, we're talking to you guys. 
Okay, okay, hands up higher, so take a look around the room. Okay, and how many people have done five to 10 or more deals? Raise your hand. Watch, look at those people, the ones who haven't done deals, get with those people that have, and pick their brain, take them to lunch, take them to breakfast, come on back here. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's absolutely true. I see so many people, and don't get me wrong, the reading phase is important. And if the reading phase takes you a month or three months or six months or 12 months, however long it takes, all I'm saying is don't get into the reading phase because you're scared to take the next step. And here's the... Knowledge is power, sure. But knowledge is only power when applied and you take action. Action takers are money makers. You can have all the knowledge in your head that you want. If you're not going to go out there and take action, it doesn't mean diddly. 20% is processes and procedures. 80% is mindset. So get your mindset right. Get pointed in the right direction. Get somebody to help you. Grab onto some mentors. Come and plug into what we're doing. Or find some people who have what you want and make sure you get with them so you can take that first step. Like you said, when you do your first deal, once you do your first one, you're gonna do another one. For me to get from zero to 10 was way harder than it was to get from 10 to 200. And so, but you gotta take that first step and the only way to get through that fair, not the only way, but the easiest way is to get through with somebody who's done it before that will show you exactly what you do and keep you from making the mistake that you're scared of. Yeah. I'll have this. I'm not as experienced as these two guys right here, but I'm, uh, you know, four, four years deep into the game, and I've done, you know, over 20 flips. And um, but like they said, it, it, in the beginning, it was hard for me to to get my first flip because it was we were 2014. I started going to read groups, and I found it. I started putting banded signs. I my house was up on the road. Someone called me on one and said, "Hey, I got a house that was in North Ward." $30,000, and I was like, that, that was good, and I like looked at the comps, what I thought were the comps, and at the time, because I wasn't a real estate agent, and I kind of evaluated what it needed to work, and then I went to a hard money lender that was in one of the groups, and I approached her with, with this deal, and she shot me down, and I kind of like lost a little confidence, and I couldn't get the money, and I was like, well, maybe I don't know what I'm doing, and then I kind of got out of it for a little while, and then I ended up back into it, got my real estate license. Well, it took me a little while because I had to go some different things. Got my real estate license, then I felt like I had more confidence and I knew what I was talking to about because I had more education. I've been listening to bigger pockets, like nonstop, like learning the lingo, meet more people. And um, I'd actually gotten a hard money loan from someone for a car lot that I was working on. And that fell through but anyway, so. I ended up doing my first deal with, with another real estate agent that was in my Keller Williams group, and we were talking about it, and she was like, I'll do a deal with you. And she was like, boom. And then I did my first deal, and my buddy Billy gave me a uh, Billy Batson, and he gave me my first wholesale deal, and he already had the contract that lined up. And kind of like tailor made, and then this lady said she'd do it. I did it, it worked out good. I made like $17,000. And then I started telling people that I was doing this deal, and then I literally had like, Three other lenders approach me, and so after I did my first one, I did four on my second round. So I picked up four more, and it was like, boom! I had one lender doing this deal, and my first lender doing another deal, and this other guy doing two deals with me that partnered 50-50 with me. So it was the point like, is to get started. Yeah. yeah. The point is get started and get out there and get talking about what you're doing and make action. Who, who here's who here's never made an offer on this property? Did you hear that? Who here has never made an offer on a piece of property? Raise your hand. Hey, come on, don't be shy. Okay. okay. So, make a resolution. Make an offer in the next 30 days. Make an offer so low that if they miraculously say yes, you're going to be thrilled to buy it. I mean, even if you don't know what you're doing, most likely they're not going to say no, but here's the thing you need to learn in this business. You need to learn what you're doing. Let me tell you something. I make. I don't make that many offers. Cliff makes a lot of offers for us. How, how often do you get rejected? A lot. A lot. And I've made a lot of offers. I've made a lot of multifamily offers. I've made a lot of offers um, over the years, and 80% of them get rejected. He who gets told no the most wins the game. Absolutely. Every time somebody tells you no, say thank you. 
meaning you're closer to the one that's going to say yes. Play a game. Don't be scared of rejection. Get out there and learn to love it. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You don't have to have a bank statement that says, I have the money to buy that house to make an offer. Just make an offer. The first thing to say is that. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, we're getting close to 7.30. And well, one more question. No, no, we're going to let people stay. We're going to let people stay. about inflation and the economy and yes. low interest rates and all? Yes, that's longer. So do we do that now? Or do um, we well, we'd like to always start and end on time. And, and we really thank everybody for coming here tonight. So I know some of you might have to leave. But we're going to stay longer than this for more questions. But what we want to do is, we is there a slide? We want to give everybody the opportunity to uh, uh, get plugged into what we're doing and to sign up for the three-day event that we have coming up in uh, December, December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Uh, we're going to give a, a do, do we have something on that, a slide or some, something like that? I know we're back with it. Yeah, we've got a three-day event coming up December 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and it's really designed to take people just like you from where you're sitting now to the next level, whether it's buying your first, second, or third house, flipping wholesale housing, or learning how to build a portfolio like a couple hundred properties. Who in here would like to have more than 10 rentals that, that they own in their portfolio? Come on, let's see it. That's everybody in this room. So you really have the right place to get positioned for 2021. So uh, we already talked about what it's going to be, and we're offering a discount tonight of $50 for the three-day event, December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Lunch is included, all meals. So what you want to do when you leave here is uh, get out there with the Catherine um, or, some, or Brittany who's sitting there and, and let, let, get a reservation uh, for that event. Anything else you want to say about that event? You have some of the people here that's gone to it. Yep, there's a couple people here that have gone to it. Who's been to our event and who's, who's been to our event before and is getting uh, you know, some coaching or mentoring with us. Take a look around the room, everybody. Take a look around the room. Go ask them to see if they've done any deals or ask them what they want. You know, it's also your way to start networking with people around here in the local real estate market. We're just local investors who have been doing what you guys want to do. I buy a house, you know, almost every week here in this town. I, like I said, I've done over a thousand flips right in Sarasota, Manatee County. Paul's wholesale hundreds of houses. And I own hundreds of rentals. Jill Lyons manages all my rentals and hundreds of others. So plug and play. Get with people that are doing it locally here. Go out there and get with us and find the money to do your deals and get some rental properties and plug it right into the systems that are already working right here, right now. So go to the back afterwards, go see them out there. And with that, uh, let's give Jay a We are so grateful to see you guys here. See you next month. And we're going to stay open. So if you have to go, I understand it's 730. We like to start at the time. But if you want to ask more questions to JB or Paul or anybody, stay around. We're going to hang tight. Cool. OK. Sounds good. Um, so, so you asked about inflation. And for anybody that, that is looking to buy rentals, this is a really important discussion. Um, so let's talk about inflation. Uh, here, who here knows what inflation is? Good. Then what they don't know, normally it's like, oh, raise their hand and I say, so what is it? And they go, oh, oh. <laughs> so I, I'm going I'm to give a real simple definition of inflation. I can give the, the formal economics definition. I'm going to give a simple definition of inflation, what some people call CPI inflation or price inflation. But it's generally the idea that prices go up. Prices go up, things are more expensive, that's inflation. When your milk costs more next month than it did last month, that's inflation. When your car costs more, when your rent costs more, that's inflation. Pretty simple, right? So here's a trick question. Is inflation good or bad? It's a trick. I like that answer. Good and bad. Good and bad. Um, so it always matters. It always matters, but yeah, so doing the right thing. So knowing if we're going to have inflation and then modulating our, our strategy to account for it, that's the important thing. So a lot of people, it, it is good and bad. If you look at it from a consumer standpoint, inflation is bad. 
as a consumer, when my milk or my eggs cost more, or my car costs more, or my couch costs more, that's not good. I don't like that. Um, I'm making, well, if there's inflation, I'm probably making more money, but if everything costs more, I'm not going to be happy. But from the government standpoint and the economy standpoint, inflation is actually considered a good thing. And here's why. The reason we have inflation is typically because businesses are doing well. Businesses have demand for their products. And when they have demand for their products, they have to make more products, which means they have to buy more inventory and they have to buy warehouse space and they have to buy equipment and they have to hire more people. And all that stuff costs money. So businesses spend that money and businesses are doing well and they pass that cost on to us. And that's why things go up in value. So typically when we have inflation, it's because the economy is doing well and businesses are doing well and businesses are making a lot of money. And so the government likes inflation because typically as things go up in price, businesses make more money. And when businesses make more money, the economy does better. So inflation is something that the government pushes because at the end of the day, the economy being successful is more about businesses doing well than it is about consumers doing well. I know we don't like to hear that, but at the end of the day, the economy is more about whether businesses are doing well as opposed to whether consumers are doing well. Inflation helps businesses do well. So the government pushes inflation. So number one, we have a government that says we want inflation. Inflation is good. Here's the other thing. The opposite of inflation is deflation. Deflation is scary because if we get a little bit of deflation, it's like gravity. Gravity kind of pushes everything down. Well, inflation, there's these inflationary pressures or deflationary pressures that kind of push the prices of things down naturally. Automation. Basically, companies can, can make a whole lot more product a whole lot cheaper with a whole lot fewer people and a whole lot, in, a whole lot less inventory and a whole lot less equipment. So in general, prices are being pushed down, and government doesn't like that. So we, government has to work really hard to kind of keep prices up because naturally they'll tend to go down. So the government says we want inflation, the Federal Reserve says we want inflation. So number one reason that, that, that we tend to see inflation is because the government wants it. And there's, there's a good saying, don't fight the Fed. The Federal Reserve wants something to get it, they want inflation. Number two things that drives inflation is interest rates. As interest rate rates go down, two things happen. One, people stop saving money. You're not going to put money in a savings account at 0.01% interest. So when interest rates go down, people say, there's no reason to say I'm going to start spending my money. When people spend their money, what happens? The economy does well, and demand goes up and prices go up. Number two thing that happens when interest rates go down, it becomes really cheap to borrow money. When it's really cheap to borrow money, what do people do? They borrow money and they buy stuff. And same thing, it makes businesses do well and prices go up and everybody's not really happy with the government's happy. So interest rates dropping. That drives inflation. What have we seen over the last three, four years, 10 years? We've seen interest rates dropping. And so that's kind of put this pressure on inflation. Number three, what's the third, what's another big thing that causes inflation? Bring money. Bring money. Have been doing any of that recently? <laughs> yeah. So we printed close to $4 trillion. Printing money causes inflation because when you have an extra four trillion dollars out there in the economy, what do people do with it? They don't take that four trillion dollars and, and, and put it in the bank. They spend it, moves through the economy. And so again, when people are buying stuff and the economy is doing well, prices are going up. So between the Federal Reserve saying they want inflation, interest rates being low, which is driving inflation, and the government printing lots of money, which drives inflation, it's probably safe to say that sometime over the next, let's say, decade, we're going to have inflation. Now, you don't get inflation without that demand, without people like wanting to buy products. Right now, we don't have a ton of demand just because everybody's home and people aren't out spending money like they were. But at some point, this COVID thing is going to be over with and people are going to get out there. They have all this money that the government's given them over the last six months. Um, not everybody, unfortunately. Uh, but a lot of people are going to have a lot of money. The savings rate over the last six months has been the highest since the 1980s. People are starting to save money. Again, not everybody, which sucks, but there are a lot of people that are saving money. There are a lot of wealthy people that are making a ton of money. Um, so when this COVID thing goes away, demand's going to increase, and between the Federal Reserve policy, interest rates, and printing money, we're gonna see inflation. So when we see inflation, what do we do? Well, what's, what don't we do? What don't we, what don't we wanna do when we see inflation? Panic. 
Okay, we definitely don't. Well, <laughs> I don't. I don't want to panic no matter what. But yes, definitely don't panic. Keep money in the bank. You, you said that. There you go. You want to keep money in the. You don't want to keep money in the bank because a dollar today is going to be worth less than a dollar tomorrow with inflation. You might be able to buy six eggs today with a dollar. Tomorrow you might be able to buy three eggs or two eggs or one egg. So cash is not good during inflation because your cash isn't keeping up with inflation. It's worth less day after day after day. So first rule of thumb is if you think there's going to be inflation or if you start seeing inflation, you don't want to keep a lot of cash. Great, we're investors, we don't do that anyway. Where do you want to put your money when you see inflation? Here are the two best ways to use your money, or here's the two best ways to hedge inflation. Number one, buying real estate or any hard assets, but especially real estate. Why is that? Well, like I said, during inflation, prices are going up. What does that mean? What else is going up? Rent. Rent is going up. And then two, your house values are going up. So when you own real estate, especially rental real estate during inflation, your rents are going up as everything else is going up in price. And your house value is going up as well as everything else that's going up in price. So instead of losing money day after day thanks to inflation, your money's actually keeping pace. In some cases, hard assets will go up more than inflation themselves. A lot of times in, in, in a lot of areas, we see real estate going up higher than inflation year over year. So real estate is, is a fantastic way to hedge against inflation. And that's why I've gone from doing a whole lot of flips and, and other stuff to buying a lot of rentals over the last couple of months. So I've added a whole lot of rentals to my portfolio over the last couple of months because I'm concerned about inflation. What's the number, not number two, the number one best thing to do to hedge against inflation? Debt. Borrowing money. Taking out loans. Why is that? Let's use an example. Let's say I take out a loan today on a property, $100,000 loan. My mortgage payment is $1,000 a month. And let's say I make $100,000 a year. I now have a $100,000 loan. I'm making $100,000 a year. My mortgage payment is $1,000 a month. I'm taking 1% of my annual income every month, and I'm paying my mortgage. Does that make sense? OK. Fast forward next year. Let's say we have massive inflation. I'm not saying we're going to see this kind of inflation. We're not. I hope not. Um, let's fast forward a year, just for the sake of argument, let's say everything's doubled in price. When everything doubles in price, typically wages double also. With inflation, we see wages go up. So next year, I'm making $200,000 a year. How much is my loan for? $100. Still $100,000, and how much is my monthly payment? $1,000, just like it was last year. Next year, it's going to be the same amount, but I'm making double. So instead of taking 1% of my paycheck every month and paying my mortgage, I'm now taking a half a percent of my paycheck every month, and I'm paying my mortgage. Basically, my lender's losing out. He lent me money at a certain rate. I'm paying it off in cheaper dollars. So the absolute best hedge against inflation is leverage, is debt. Now, I'm not telling people to go out and take out ridiculous amounts of debt. I, I tend to keep my debt levels relatively small, but I do carry debt. I hate debt, but I carry it because I believe that we're going to have inflation. And I want to be able to pay off my rentals with one year salary in 10 years as opposed to 10 year salary today. Does that make sense? So anybody out there that's concerned about inflation, and you should be, again, it may not be really bad today or tomorrow or next year, but I think over the next 10 years, basically the, the Federal Reserve has said, it used to be that they were targeting 2% inflation per year, meaning they want prices of, of stuff to go up about 2% a year. Uh, what they found is we haven't hit that 2% target, and they're starting to get concerned that we're going to see this deflationary spiral where prices start going down and they can't stop it from happening. And so the Fed came out a couple weeks ago and they said, we no longer want 2% inflation. We want average 2% inflation over the long term, which since we've seen a good bit below 2% in the past, that's them basically saying we want to see 3, 3.5, three 4% over the next few years. So my guess is that the Federal Reserve is going to implement some policies over the next couple of years based on what they've said that's really going to push inflation. So anybody here that believes inflation is going to happen, and I do, um, you should be buying rental properties or hard assets in general. And you should be taking out reasonable, not over leveraging, reasonable loans against those properties. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's it. What else? This is a perennial question. Money fast or deal fast? 
Money first or deal first? Um, I like to know that I have sources for money. I don't necessarily need the money first, but I want to have a plan. So go talk to a hard money lender and say, hey, if I bring you a deal, can you underwrite me? Can you just look at my financials real quick? Tell me, is my credit score good enough? Is my net worth good enough? Am I making enough income? If I bring you a decent deal, will you be able to fund it? He's not guaranteeing he's going to fund the deal, but he's basically underwriting you and saying, yeah, I, I think I can get this done. Likewise, a portfolio lender, a small bank, or a partner, you say, hey, Joseph, I'm thinking about doing a deal. I'm going to need some cash. Like, if it's a good deal, is something you would consider talking to me about? And you might say yes, but then if four other people to say yes, and now I know I have a 20% chance with each of you, um, I might be comfortable to then move forward with the deal. Um, so my suggestion is have a path for that money before you start going to look for properties or simultaneously. But don't necessarily wait to look for properties before somebody says, oh yeah, I'm going to give you $180,000. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. All right, two more questions. Two more questions. Two more questions. You talked about if you have a big portfolio and all of a sudden they won't let you evict your tenant and they don't have to pay. And what's going to happen long term with all that? So... Um, okay, maybe you can fill in on this. Give all the as well. Jill. Back here. Let's have some... Jill. Jill's our rental expert back here. She manages close to 500 properties or several hundred of them are mine. And she's uh, tuned into all of that. And we've been through that for the last six months. So we'll let Jill have a, have a little say here. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, we have, with our experience, we had four that we were able to evict. Okay. So you're not necessarily strapped. If you know how to work, this, work the law, you can evict, not for just non-payment of rent. Um, but ultimately, in this area, Sarasota of Bradenton, every one of our rents have been paid. Where we had to go find what charities would help and what wouldn't, and did help them with paperwork, you know, because the tenants didn't know what they were doing. We had every single rent paid throughout the whole entire year. So point is, if you have a good property management company who <laughs> knows what's going on out there, you're going to go the extra leg, like find out what organizations can fund the people that are hurting and are continually in contact with the tenants there because they have a good relationship. Some of the horror stories that you hear, whether the times are like they are or not, uh, make a huge difference on whether you're going to continue your journey to build a, a portfolio and actually get to the point where you can have passive income. So it's very critical as you start to uh, build your real estate portfolio to align yourself with a good property management company. Uh, I don't think you manage any of your own properties. I would guess not. Anybody who wants to have a life uh, will quickly learn that you don't want to manage properties. And it's always good to start doing the right things at the very beginning of your real estate investing career because what it gives you is the potential to have legs and to make it a career and last a long time. If you start the wrong way and think you want to save 10% on managing properties and you, you think you like people and want to get to know people, uh, what you're going to find out is you're going to get calls on Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all the times you don't want it. And at some point in time, you're going to figure out, what the heck did I get myself into? And at that time, you're going to get caught up in not doing the right thing. It's like, if you want to learn how to give to charities or give up, you know, tithe, you don't start after you have the money. You start with your kids, you know, and they get a dollar, give away 10%. You gotta learn the proper habits early on, like compounding money, property management, and uh, buying right. And I'm gonna throw up one other idea there, and this is why it's so important to screen your tenants well. Um, in my experience, there are two types of people in this world, and I know I break things down way too simply sometimes, but there are two types of people in this world. They're the types of people that they put paying for the roof over their head ahead of anything else in their life. They will never risk not having a roof over the head of themselves and their family. And then the other type of people are those that don't. <laughs> when it's, it's, it's true. There are people that will never miss a rent payment or a mortgage payment unless literally they're willing to be homeless. And then there are people who they'll pay their car payment or their cable payment before the mortgage payment and then hope they can figure out a way to negotiate for their, their landlord. So you need to figure out you're putting tenants in, or you need to make sure your property management company is screening um, in a way that they figure out before they're putting their heads in, and you're setting the criteria appropriately that the people that go into your tent, that in, into your rentals, are the types of people that are willing to always pay. And 
Make sure your, your property managers are calling references, calling past landlords, um, and good property managers will not just call and say, hey, I got your name from Joe Smith. He says you were his landlord. Oh, yeah, I was landlord. Yeah, it was great, fantastic. Instead, they'll call and they'll say something like, so I'm calling on behalf of Joe Smith. He said he was, uh, he was uh, a tenant of yours at 512 Main Street, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, it was great. Now, I'm sorry, he didn't say 512 Main Street. He said 314 Blue Jay Street, and now you realize that the person was lying because they didn't even know. They heard that. Well, you know, get a good, good property manager. I'm trying to get rid of the tenant. I'll say that they were a great tenant. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's three kinds of people. We're gonna end this right here. There's three kinds of people. Some people watch it happen, some people make it happen, some people wonder what the heck happened. You know, people are action takers or not. We're gonna ask you guys to take some action on your life so you're not sitting here next year and not having bought your first house. Get yourself plugged in. Go back there, come to our three day, come next week because uh, you, you guys want to be action takers, that's why you're here tonight. And we're going to close it up with one more question and then we're going to call it a night. Wow, I answered everybody's question. Awesome. <laughs> 2021, you're the single and multifamily. All the single. <laughs> no, it, it, I, I think so. Certain certain asset classes are not going to perform equally. Um, I like Class B and B minus multifamily. I think Class C multifamily is going to be in for for some trouble just until COVID is, is over with. Um, class A, you're going to see some major rent compression. So I don't like Class A, but I like strong Class B multifamily. Um, and I like single family in general. I always like single family as long as you're buying right. The nice thing about single family rentals, um, if, if I buy a rental today in Sarasota for $200,000 and the market crashes tomorrow um, and that goes down to $20,000, I don't care as long as I'm still getting the same rent. As long as the tenants are paying rent and I, I can pay my mortgage every month, in 10 years, 20 years, it'll, it'll be worth more than it was. So I'm gonna tell a story. I'm going to tell a little story that just validates that because I've been buying real estate here for the past 20 something years. And one of the things I always say, and I say earlier, it's always the right time to buy real estate if you buy real estate the right way. I bought an apartment complex way back in around 1998, 2000, 2000 and I paid a million dollars for it. And I borrowed all the money. I found somebody who believed in me. I borrowed all the money to get this place. And I've owned it right up till now. And over the last 20 years, at one point it was worth 500000 another point it was worth $2 million. But the bottom line was I bought it the right way and structured the deal. So every month I was paying down a mortgage and putting something in Mr. Hip Pocket Bank. It's now 20 years later, I have no mortgage on the property and the property is worth more. So buying real estate as an asset class, multifamily or single family, is always the right time to protect your money as long as you buy it the right way and structure the deal that it's not dependent on what's happening out there in the marketplace. I like real estate because you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it, and you can collect rents on it. And that's the opportunity that's available for everybody. Sarasota and Florida, people are coming here, they're leaving the big cities. Sarasota has so many amenities that this is gonna be a great opportunity in 2021. Get yourself positioned, come back and see us. Give Gary a big round of applause. This was really great to see everybody again after these six months. Thanks again for coming. Go back, get signed up. We'll see you next month. Thanks again. Tune into our virtual and all of that stuff.